Hello, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to Brain Club. I'm Mel Hauser. I use she, they pronouns. I'm the executive director of All Brains Belong. Let me share screen, get us oriented to our conversation. So the last week of every month um, is our book chat. Um, and if this is your first Brain Club book chat, um, don't worry, most people um, have not read um, the, the, the books that we chat about at Book Chat. Um, uh, what we do as staff is we um, abstract out themes and um, we have discussion based on those themes and we look at quotes and videos and things from, from the book so that we can um, have, have a community conversation about the themes. Brain Club, of course, is our educational space to um, uh, that, that as we try to provide education about neurodiversity and related topics of inclusion. It's about bringing people together based on a shared vision of what's possible and contributing to systems change by shifting social norms and promoting new ways of thinking and being in order to collectively change the world. It's our hope that what you experience here at Brain Club um, is something that you um, can, can uh, in other realms of, of, of your life. Um, it's a place to collectively learn and unlearn together. And gosh, there is so much, um, uh, speaking for myself, uh, so much unlearning that needs to be done. It is our hope that this is a place where people feel safe. And for many people that that may feel quite different from um, the outside world. Um, although All Brains Belong has uh, all different types of programs that do all kinds of things, this one is not for medical or mental health advice. It's also not a support group or a place to problem solve individual situations. Um, this is for education purposes only. All forms of participation are welcome here. Um, you can have your video on or off. And even if it's on, we don't expect anything of you. We certainly do not need you to sit still or look at the camera or any of those other neuronormative things. So please feel free to walk or move or fidget or stim or eat, um, whatever, whatever needs doing. You are welcome to communicate however you are most comfortable. You can unmute and use mouth words. You can type in the chat. Um, we also have private chat enabled. And in addition to affirming all aspects of identity, um, in order to make this a safe experience for all participants, we prioritize the group's needs over the individual. And one of the ways that we do that is that we tread cautiously around sensitive topics. And um, although there will be um, or, or many sensitive topics that will come up um, within the themes of this book, and we'll give a content warning um, for at the, um, uh, as, after I get through the introduction slides so that um, you can participate tonight with informed consent. Closed captioning is enabled. You just have to toggle it on at your end if you'd like to use it. So depending on your version of Zoom, you might see the live transcript closed captioning icon. If not, look for the more dot 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 and choose show subtitles. You can also uh, do the same issue side subtitles if you want to turn it off. Um, I was I was doing a training earlier today and um, I was showing someone something and I I was I said more and I like aut automatic speech took over and I said more dot dot dot. There was no in fact dot 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 associated with my word more. It was fascinating. I wanted to share that. I've officially opened the chat. I'll see it if folks are using it. Hello, everybody. See lots of lots of uh, familiar folks in the chat. Um, but speaking of the chat, the chat is for many people a site of conflicting access needs. The chat is essential for many communicators to be able to communicate and participate and access this program. It's a way of communicating without mouth words. Um, it's, it provides a, 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 a reprieve from um, uh, the demands on working memory, allows for more processing time, more people can share ideas and have you know, back and forth uh, conversation. And for other community members, the chat is visually cluttering. It's distracting. Um, some people have startle responses when the chat pops up, especially when it moves really quickly. 
Um, so our best advice to navigate conflicting access needs is if you're someone who the chat bothers you um, uh, and you have a nervous system response to the chat, um, you could try one or both of these things. After the first pop-up, try not closing the window. This way, when additional messages pop up, it won't pop. It'll just replace the text without getting that startle response. You can also try disabling chat preview by clicking on the up caret next to the word chat on your toolbar. It'll default to having a checkbox next to show chat previews. If you tap on show chat previews or click on show chat previews, that checkbox will go away. And I hope that you won't have any more chat pop-ups. Okay. So we are wrapping up our April 2024 Brain Club series on autistic culture. Um, today, as I mentioned, um, Book Chat on Autistic and Black by Kayla Allen Omeza. Kayla Allen Omeza is an author and researcher, a Fulbright scholar, and founder of a nonprofit organization called I'm Heard. Um, which is an organization that works to destigmatize mental illness in marginalized communities. And um, tonight, um, we will have the opportunity to uh, watch some video clips from Kayla directly um, through, through previous interviews um, with, with other uh, organizations. And um, we'll have a number of, of quotes up on the screen for us to, 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 to learn from and discuss together. Why did we choose this book? So as a predominantly white-led organization with a predominantly white staff, um, we felt like it was important as we discuss autistic culture, we thought it was really important to center the ex experiences. We talk, you know, we talk a lot at Brain Club all the time about centering lived experiences. But there are people with lived experiences that we don't share. And we thought it was really essential to elevate those voices um, and um, learn from, be curious about, and learn, learn about um, the ways in which um, we um, have, have things in common, have things that are different, and um, uh, spaces where um, when there are areas where we have relative privilege, um, that, that, that we use that privilege to be able to make our community safe for, for all people with all aspects of identity. So that's why we chose this book. I do need to give a content warning because the experiences of autistic black people in this book call attention to racism, death, police brutality, ableism. So as we uh, we've, as, as, as we dive into some of the themes and examples from the book, um, these concepts will, um, play out. These are some quotes from the author. This book is not intended to segregate or enforce identity politics, but to bring previously silenced voices to the conversation. Everyone reading this book is responsible for the well-being and protection of all fellow human beings. I hope this book will bring both awareness and empowerment so that you can advocate for those for whom you might not have understood previously. So we're gonna begin with a short video clip um, of Kayla responding to the question, what do you hope readers take away from the book? Nope, we got no sound. Sorry about that. Problem. Um, let's see. Sierra taught me how to do this earlier. Tech support having tech support problems. If anyone's gonna figure it out, it's yeah, you. Yeah, let's do it on the fly, real quick. Good 
Because if this were happening to me, I would just call you. Today, Kayla. Um, not uh, nothing particularly. Um, that yeah, that I yeah, that I yeah have the great stuff. So yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions. So I'm just happy that you came to join us again. And again, I am I am honored that you invited me to collaborate with you on this book. I do have a, a small section that was with me and maybe another parent i think and that was yeah. really nice of you to even invite me to collaborate um of course yeah yeah thanks for thanks for being a part i was yeah i was really i was honored for you to be part of it <laughs> yeah I, I appreciate that and i love i do i do love to like i don't want to overstep into communities that i'm not a part of obviously but also i love to when i'm invited to you know give my perspective in in that community sense so that was um yeah it was awesome yeah. oh so, thank you cass what is i don't know if i asked this already or not my memory is like so shot today what is one big idea you hope readers take away from the book um that is a really good question um it's definitely that we all have lots of learning about each other um and um even if uh, if we're not black and autistic, um, it's easy to assume that that um, it's easy it's easy to um, to brush like yeah either community aside autistic autistic or black um, <laughs> um, community um, aside basically when we're when we're thinking about um, autism or or the African American experience for example. Um, but it's I and I hope this book shows that how how much. Um, yeah, awareness and acceptance is needed um, in um, in this intersection, um, um, and yeah, yeah, I think that's and I think for those of us who are autistic and black, that we're not we're not alone. Um, a lot of us have really similar stories, similar emotions, similar cultures, even just like across the world, just like just um, um, that. Um, yeah, I think people. I hope uh, autistic. I look, hope black autistic people feel seen, and I hope non-black um, or non-autistic um, people um, learn basically or, or understand better and yeah that's definitely what my my two goals you know. so here are the four themes that uh, stood out um, to us um, on our staff as we read this book so theme number one, acknowledging intersectionality, and we'll talk about that next. Um, the harsh, some harsh realities, including higher rates of police brutality, um, higher rates of being unhoused. We talk a lot, even um, you know, uh, uh, we, even without um, uh, centering the experiences of Black autistic people about barriers to autism diagnosis. And in this group, those barriers to diagnosis can be exponentially increased and therefore to be excluded from support. And finally, the theme about the collective social responsibility that all of us have um, to accept, to advocate for, and protect one another. So theme number one, intersectionality. Um, when we think about all of the different ways um, that people in our community are marginalized and othered, um, you know, actually, what we what 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 I what I think I'd like to do um, is is we're gonna watch a, a video clip from an old brain club. Um, uh, that that I think I think will um, provide some insight into um, in, into this topic. So um, we're gonna. This is a, this is a throwback to. Uh, I think this was June of twenty twenty three. Elena, take it away. Um, um, but 
Um, but I'll, of course, I'll give it my my best shot for myself. Um, sure. So <laughs> uh, it's, the, it's the next it's the next video uh, fighting time. Oh, hold up, sorry. It's the uh, the the PSJ four or the it was the video four that just got that got reordered. Sorry about that. No worries. Let's see. Right here. It's yeah, it starts at 305. Yeah, that oh. Uh-oh. Yeah, I think that might have oh, here we go. Yep, 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 yep. Sorry about that, folks. No worries. All right. So um, how how does tonight's topic fit into our ongoing conversations about inclusion? Right. So. Yep. So, so inclusion is perceived belonging um, when there are people in our community who do not feel that they belong. We do not have an inclusive community. Right. So so we, zooming out to think about all of the different ways in which society doesn't do a good job of this and what is our role in 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 that in doing it differently and we've been speaking for the past several weeks specifically about the intersectional experiences all the different aspects of identity that are stigmatized marginalized othered and how um that uh, acknowledging and talking about all of these very these, these topics. We can't talk about neurodivergence in a vacuum. We have to talk about all of the different aspects of identity. And so we, we continue continue our conversation. So um, I am thrilled to introduce Chrissy Colon Brandt, who is an educator, mom, and lifelong learner. She served as both a classroom teacher and a school administrator. She's passionate about teaching and learning and the power of honest education to aid in the creation of new, more just worlds for all. Chrissy has facilitated um, workshops about a book that she has co-authored that we speak about regularly here at Brain Club, Parenting for Social Justice. And so Chrissy has facilitated workshops uh, about the book, as well as student affinity groups, educator conversation groups, and various professional learning workshops for education professionals. Chrissy's a mom of three, including an almost one-year-old and enjoys reading to her children and introducing them to new and fantastical worlds. Chrissy has a Bachelor of Arts from Barnard College and a Master's of Education from Hunter College, where I also attended. Um, she lives in Vermont with her family. All right, Chrissy, I'm, uh, I'm going to turn it over to you. Awesome. Thanks, everybody, for having me. I'm really excited to be here. I feel very grateful and honored. And what a small world. I can talk about Hunter later. It's like, I love when that happens. Let's, let's, let's pause here. I'm cool. OK, we'll, we'll, we're going to play. We're going to play um, a, a little bit more of this old brain club. But first, I want to um, look at a couple of quotes uh, from this book. You want yeah. Kayla Allen Omeza writes, intersectionality is about recognizing the necessity to acknowledge everything about an identity that marginalizes a person. Uh, being a Black autistic woman in a war zone, for example. Uh, she further described, I longed to befriend more Black people. To my dismay, however, I was surprised at how much I didn't quite fit in. My autistic traits caused others to see me as odd off or different before being considered the same. When I tried to join autistic spaces, I often find myself being the only person of color in the room. So let's, um, sorry for the zigzag. Elena, let's go back to, um, to that video at 22.55. Sorry, I just closed that one. It'll just take me a second to get back to it. 22.55, you said? Yep. Okay. 
Okay. And that these are the sort of justice topics explicitly talked about in the book. I'm the co-author of the racial justice topic. There's a, a, a section on economic justice, disability justice, and gender justice. Um, there are other chapters in the book kind of about what is social justice and what is parenting for social justice. And then um, a, a, a great chapter just about collective liberation. Like we're all in this together. And so how do we think about kind of all of us, our intersectional identities and all of us sort of working together for justice because um, it's so easy to um, fall into the trap of like, my injustice is harder than your injustice, right? Um, that that can happen, a kind of what sometimes is co coined oppression Olympics. Um, but um, that's, that's how we don't get what we want, right? That's how we don't get our liberated world is by sort of dividing um, our resources really thinking about how do we collectively liberate all of us because we all have something to gain we're all intersectional beings which we're going to talk a little bit about um like i said there are lots of resources each chapter is full of resources there's an appendix of resources um there's even uh, if you go to the parenting for justice parenting for social justice website there's uh, an additional appendix and lots of other materials there so i invite you to do that um so while there are discrete topics, the intersectionality is um, important and clear and comes through. And I, I know you've been talking about that and maybe you've done an exercise like this, but we're gonna try a little something. So if you'll go to the next slide, you do contain multitudes. Um, and what I think I'm gonna do, cause it'll help me is actually open my slides on my computer just so I can um, better direct you. There we go. Uh, so I invite you, whether it's kind of just in your head or on a piece of paper or how whatever works for you, typing in another screen, to think about kind of your many identities. How do you identify? Um, how do you identify racially? What would you say your socioeconomic class is now, maybe as a kid? Um, how you identify sex and gender and or whichever feels more comfortable? Um, Think about all your social identities, religion, ability, disability, the ones that sort of come to mind. I invite you to kind of think about and name all of those. Um, so I'll give you a, sec a couple moments to do that, to sort of think about maybe two or three that are at the forefront that maybe take up space in your brain. Um, sometimes I do this activity as like a brain and sort of drawing um, how much space are these things taking up for you? And you don't have to share, you can just take a moment to think about that and maybe give us a thumbs up, like I've got two or three I can work with in my head or written down or just ready for the next part. And someone can let Elena, me know. Elena, I think we can pause okay. here. Or we need more time because I can't see. Number two, misdiagnosis and underdiagnosis. Play another video of Kayla Allen Omeza discussing um, diagnosis. Video three at 5.49. Themselves disabled on top of that. And what if we are the only person with these conditions that look like us, have the same culture as us, and have, or maybe speak the same native language as us? So, I mean, that sounds a bit isolating, right? Um, because it can be um, for many reasons. As as myself, as a Black autistic woman, I who didn't consider that autism could apply to me, I labeled myself as many things. And other people helped as well. <laughs> I was labeled as antisocial. I was bougie. I was weird, awkward, obsessed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I called myself helpless before ever calling myself hopeful. I called myself lazy before I called myself loved. And I would be sitting at a large dining um, table at a Brandon Hall dining 
um, cafeteria, surrounded by other black athletes and smart, ambitious um, students, and felt completely alone. Um, and I'm not sure, and <laughs> I am completely sure that I'm not the only one in this in, on this call that's ever felt isolated or alone at one point. And I'm pretty sure uh, many others with intersectional disabilities can relate at this present moment. Um, so I want to personally share ways that I was able to position myself to loving myself and my little life around me and to share ways of how we could all uplift others outside of our comfort zone to find the best in themselves as well. To do this, we need the classic empathy um, skill set, which of course really is just learning and understanding each other, our unique experiences, and how we can work with our uniqueness. So before yeah, we begin, sense. let's pull out. over here. Thank you. So um, while there may have been some aspects of that description that I, as a white, late-identified autistic person, connected with, um, the book goes then on to share some research. Research showing that Black and Brown autistic youth um, are less likely to be diagnosed, um, are disciplined more harshly in school, and higher rates of misdiagnosis with behavioral disorders, personality disorders. Here are some quotes. Um, and by the way, um, this book features interviews with Black autistic people from around the world. So um, uh, my GP, uh, general practice doctor, um, was dismissive. He said, I'm too intelligent to have anything wrong with me. I should just work on what I'm good at and go away. Certainly a theme we've discussed here at Brain Club before. I can't be autistic because I held a job before, because I was married, because I work out, and don't get me started on my children. These descriptions were really uncomfortable for me to read. They wanted to put me on the preschool to prison pipeline. This quote from Megan Ashburn, who you saw as the interviewer of that first video clip we watched. Um, her child uh, had a teacher who would basically trigger him and taunt him or treat him like an animal. She would send him home. She would depict him as animalistic. So Megan has two children um, who are black and autistic. But we know, even here in Vermont, we know that exclusionary discipline, um, seclusion, restraint, expulsion, um, happen at far higher rates to children of color and children with disabilities. Um, we know in Vermont, um, at least 587 sweet little loves are secluded and or restrained in public school each year. That's still happening in 2024. then goes on to say that even with diagnosis, there are often barriers to acceptance. Any kind of illness or condition was hushed up and never spoken about. Even if someone were to find out that someone was autistic, for example, white people might take their job away, or you might not even get that promotion. You didn't want to give hiring managers an even greater excuse to exclude you besides racism. quote um, from um, a, an interviewee from um, Tanzania. Stigma is so high that most families of autistic people hide their children indoors.
we're socialized to hide our autistic traits or anything else about us that is different or makes us vulnerable. It's scolded out of us real quick. This passage, racial bias and stereotypes that practitioners have about autism can limit diagnosis and access to services. I was at one point guilty of seeing only what I wanted to see about autism, a non-speaking, violent, um, re reframed as overstimulated, white toddler, and not making an effort to think about the ramifications of that thinking. Um, in, in, in the chat, thanks for sharing. So uh, um, a lot of dysdiagnosis in, in, in Indonesia as well. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you for sharing that. Theme number three, harsh realities. Describes the experience of systemic racism contributing to fear of being involuntarily hospitalized or taken into police custody. When I read multiple interviewees describing this phenomenon, um, I was, I mean, I, I, I feel like there's so many layers of privilege that I don't even know about that I have. And it's like peeling away the onion layers. When I read about this and I, when I really thought about how I have at never ever have I thought about that I would be involuntarily hospitalized or taken into police custody. The exceptional privilege that that is. This quote really stood out to me. Why should I trust this system that has experimented on my ancestors and colonized the world? Watch this video clip. So this is uh, Kayla reading um, uh, about half a chapter from her book. This, this is the story of Olivia Brown, um, who is describing an experience um, of having a meltdown um, in the presence of police. I'll, I'll, of course, I'll give it my, my best shot for myself. Um, sure. So <laughs> this chapter is called, um, it's chapter one, um, Biding Time. Um, it's set in, it's set in, the setting is in um, Birmingham, England. Um, it's also, um, the setting is also in Harvard University in Massachusetts, United States. So this is Olivia Brown in Birmingham, England. It says, not guilty was the final verdict. The lead juror's words jolted Olivia into a whirlwind of thoughts. Her world, which at the moment was the courtroom, spun as well. A black cloud seemed to emerge, leaving others' reactions and final words inaudible. Her attacker was found not guilty. She was found unreliable. And that was all she needed to hear to understand that she was, once again, deeply and severely misunderstood. As always, Olivia had no choice but to get up. The clouded room choked her, silencing her from speaking to her family or lawyer. She took one deep breath, then another, and one more. The emotional cloud dissipated as she took her final steps out of the courtroom. She'd hoped that she that she hoped that that would be the case. However, a second cloud quickly emerged in this place, a less common one, and one more difficult to explain. She feared this cloud. Her hands flapped softly at first, like the pedestrians minding their business on the pavement. Gradually, her arms moved like the British cyclists abruptly swerving to, the, to their bike lane across the street. Then Olivia's voice came back, louder than the horns of the irritated vehicles making way. Olivia told me how she erupted into stems and wails made from overstimulation. Um, quote, um, my world came crashing down, Olivia said, and I was completely unhinged. Uh, she recounted that outside of the courtroom, most police officers were afraid of her stems coupled with her emotional turmoil. They came not to her aid, but to protect her attacker and others from her reaction. As they approached, however, they feared for themselves instead. One officer called for backup, then another, as Olivia continued her meltdown. The original cloud began to reemerge as Olivia's fears grew stronger. Before she knew it, she was on the ground. 
She, scre- she still screamed and wailed while the officers still didn't know how to approach her. Pedestrians, cyclists, and vehicle onlookers began to take notice as Olivia could not break free from the cloud's grip. Finally, a Grenadian security guard pulled Olivia, pulled Olivia up and stroked her hair. The black security guard pulled her close until her breathing slowed and the cloud vanished. A few days later, Olivia re- relayed her trauma to an older family friend who also had a negative experience with the police in his youth. With ackee, saltfish, and fried dumpling on the cooker, Olivia's friend reminded her about slave rebellions on the ships during the trans- transatlantic slave trade. He told her how the revolts on the ships were more likely to happen when there were more enslaved women on board. And the book, um, and the book Wake, The Hidden History of Women-Led Slave Revolts, published in 2022, the author, Dr. Rebecca Hall, noted that enslaved women were less likely to be chained or tied on board compared to men. The woman who led these revolts had to wait to act when it was most appropriate to make their move. In her case, Olivia wanted to create an advocacy initiative when it was the most appro- appropriate time for her to do so. Biding time, Olivia said, recalling what a family friend told her. They were biding their time, so I should also bide my time and wait for the right time of resistance to, su- to successfully rebel. Her friend reminded her to follow the enslaved woman's um, lead and not lash out rashly. She didn't know it yet, but she had a community to form to help create change in England. Olivia explained to me how the Black Canadian security guard was the perfect example of what community policing is. We need a cultural understanding for all races and neurotypes, but until then, we need to bide our time and have more public officials from diverse ethnic groups, and we all should support them. The, um, end quote. The Canadian security guard, Olivia knew, understood that she was afraid to end up like many Black autistic individuals before her. As her family friend once was, Olivia was scared of being fatally restrained due to being perceived as a threat. Quote, in this predominantly white area, it was the connection to my culture that was important to me. While I didn't always remember to follow that advice, biding my time when I, when I did is what ultimately saved me. Uh, end quote. Said, when conducting Olivia's interview, it was as if we ha- she and I were looking in a mirror in both experiences and in facial expressions. expressions. Our mirrored expressions reflected a barrier we imposed on understanding both ourselves and each other. Oblivious to our mirrored personas, I asked Olivia to take me back to the beginning. Unlike the courthouse, it was time for Olivia to be given the opportunity to explain her hopes, her dreams, and who she is as a human being. Afterwards, Thank you, I Elena. figured I'd fire her asking her how mm-hmm. What about these quotes? To be a Black autistic male means that one's sense of childhood is cut short and the need to be hyper aware of your surroundings to avoid violence and abuse. How dangerous the world is for those who didn't choose how people perceive them as a threat. How many Westerners go about their lives ignorant of the plight of others? This is a description of a 10-year-old. Every time Nadumi goes outside, people stare at him or make rude comments like, what's wrong with him? Nadumi's mannerisms, sudden movements, sounds, stimming to self-soothe and process emotions are all factors that make a growing Black boy stand out. He has noticed that people are afraid of him and that he's worried it would get worse as he gets, quote, bigger. Nadumi, who is a non-speaking communicator and communicates with a letter board, added, when I sense fear in people, I want to cry. Dearest quote in the chat. I think this is such a clear example of how the things that we have to do to keep ourselves safe, like masking in public, can have negative impact on our health, worsening burnout, and how this leads to worse health outcomes at those at the intersection of Black and autistic identities.
Findings from the Center for American Progress. Oh, <laughs> yes, Alina, we're all set. Thank you so much. I, is the, la the last video I have on my hard drive so I can play it without, without it getting all distorted by my bad internet connection. Thank you so much. You're, not, you're never breaking my focus. I never had any focus to begin with. <laughs> Um, findings from the Center for American Progress state that at least 50% of people who die during interactions with law enforcement in the U.S. are disabled. When a person is Black and disabled, they face more danger. This one I did not know. According to the World Disability Institute, 50% of Black disabled people are arrested by the time they are 28 years old. Any misunderstood behaviors done by Black disabled people are viewed as criminal before any consideration is given to the ways that their disability affects them. So wrapping up before we open this up to discussion, um, theme number four, um, this book is um, uh, about our collective responsibility to one another. Whether you are learning some of this for the first time, or if you yourself experienced this, um, how, do, how, how do we build a community where all people with all identities feel safe showing up as their full authentic self with regard to all aspects of their identity. They feel safe that they actually are safe. How do we make that happen? I'm going to play one more video clip. Um, this one, I, 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 I did an interview last night for next week's Brain Club, and uh, this could not be more fitting. So next week, just in preview, um, uh, is, is a community panel about um, internalized ableism and identity and what came up in that in this discussion, I think, um, lends itself to this theme as well. So here is... Simone Arnold. Shared sound because I wasn't previously sharing anything with sound. Okay, now I've got sound. Like you don't have to do it that way. And like having people who are willing to entertain the idea of a kinder world is also a really big thing. The other thing that I think is really important is internalized ableism, all the isms are just at the end of the day related to white supremacy culture and our capitalistic culture. And if you want to dismantle that, you're dismantling all of them. You can't just dismantle one. And so your commitment to dismantling your internalized ableism means like you really ought to be open to dismantling all of those other things, because otherwise they're going to sneak in there in really sneaky, sneaky ways and like fuel that internalized ableism. Because if you're still buying into the idea that you're like capitalism is the way to be and like you have to put out and be productive, no amount of self-love and compassion is going to work to like overcome that. In the same way that like if you hold any belief that some people are better than or more worthy than even on like a subconscious level, it's going to make it really hard for you to extend that kindness to yourself and to like deconstruct that shame. And so doing this work is really deep work and very healing on a lot of different levels. You can't just do one of them. You kind of got to do all of them and that doesn't mean you have to start with all of them it's just like recognizing like you're going to be questioning a lot of things and that's what makes identity formation like so hard is you're going to find yourself deconstructing so many things so it's not a race this is a marathon this is something you're going to do over time i have been 
deeply entrenched in like deconstructing my own connection to white supremacy work since I was like in high school. Like I've been doing that since then. And every day there's still more that I find out. And I'm like, geez, okay. <laughs> and so be kind to yourself around that. Cause you're going to be like, I got this ableism thing on, on lock and you'll find something. It's okay. We all do. We, you know, it's like a fish being like, how do you know you're in water kind of situation? So you're going to find it constantly. So just being kind about that process. So you heard Simone uh, reference um, white supremacy culture, and we're going to put a link in the chat um, to uh, a, a famous article um, about aspects of white supremacy culture that many white people don't know are part of white supremacy culture. I certainly did not know until I read this article a few years ago. Lizzie, if you can pop that link in the chat. Thanks. I don't know that that's the best link. I wonder if if you can post the, if that's going to like your Google Drive, I think. Maybe just post the the website it came from. Okay. Thanks. Sorry. Absolutely. Um, uh, Raka sharing hypervigilance causes too much stress, right? Having an, a, an autonomic nervous system that is cranked up constantly having you know cortisol the stress hormone cranked up constantly um it, it's 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 it has huge long-term health consequences so um i wanted to 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 open this up to discussion around what, what gets in the way of, of understanding? What gets in the way of advocating? What gets in the way of, 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 of building a community where all people can belong? Summer says fear. Taylor says what stands out to me um, as we, how we need to decenter standard and move away from attitudes of suspicion and therefore ensure safety. Thanks, Taylor. Fear. Bruno. Uh, I think that, uh, or hello everyone. Um, this is all good stuff and for sure some of this is new information for me. It's, uh, um, uh, there's, there's pieces of this, um, I mean, tribalism is going to be a piece of this. It's like, you know, uh, for my generation, I grew up in a very, very white Vermont and teaching myself to uh, to understand that other people who don't look like me are OK. They're still human and they deserve to live their lives as anyone else should. Um, and so it takes a willingness on our part to also seek out and learn new information. Um, and, and that's a really important piece, I think, particularly for older generations who tend to get stagnant in their education and willingness to learn. Um, it's, it's very important. Um, I also wanted to mention, because it's relevant, at least here in the United States, that there, um, from my just glancing at some, at a search, there are 12 states here who do not participate in the Medicaid program. And so that means that, that uh, 
unless you are uh, like pregnant or with children, uh, if you live in poverty, you don't get health care. And, uh, you know, uh, it, it, affect, it affects everyone, but for sure, uh, people of color are probably far more affected by that sort of thing. And, you know, changing how that works in our country is, is something, you know, that can help. Certainly. Thank you, Bruno. I think that there are so many, like, I think, I think like Simone shared in that last video clip, it, it's all of the isms, um, racism, ageism, uh, all of it, right? It's, 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 it's classism, like everything just all stacks up and it's all harmful to everyone. Um, yeah, and I think that there's so much, you know, you, um, what, what, what you said, Bruno, really what stood out to me is just the amount of, of unlearning, learning and unlearning. Um, and I think people of all ages, um, uh, uh, it's certainly a journey. Sierra, you had your hand up. Yeah, um, I think one thing that um, this this conversation brings up for me is I was just um, reading the book Poly Secure about um, polyamory and one thing the author was talking about was that uh she often sees people of relative privilege especially you know white cis upper class men who are starting in um you know are, are starting to explore polyamory and are suddenly facing discrimination for the first time in that experience and that um oftentimes they are you know that's a really important thing and that's a really big thing to talk about and oftentimes that's the feeling that's being centered in couples therapy or in groups and that, you know, the, the person experiencing discrimination for the first time or experiencing that othering for the first time, um, we really need to learn from people who have been experiencing this forever, who have been in this realm of discrimination and othering for their whole lives or at the intersection of multiple identities for a long time. Um, and I think, I don't know. I, I guess that I guess that's where that's where I came in. I think I think we see that with um, neurodivergent communities a lot, and just kind of that that knowledge that you know if you're facing discrimination for the first time by being out as neurodivergent or something like that, um, that that we we need to learn from everybody else in that in that place. Thank you, Sierra. Um, that that yeah. Sarah. Yeah, and I think it's something that um that we all come to at at all different ages, right? Like like learning about this stuff happens at all ages and when I learned about, you know, like restraint and seclusion being disproportionately used against children of color and children with disabilities, like this is starting at the early childhood level all the way through. And um, you know, just that we're all coming at this at various points in life and um, trying to unpack it. Um, and the first step, I, I really, I've said this in the chat too. I think the first step is really looking at our own privilege and realizing that we have a lot of privilege that we maybe don't recognize on a day-to-day -day basis. share in the chat um oh i want to oh, sorry i just I, I missed a lot of things sorry um let's scroll up okay so um uh weaver first said um the only way to disarm whiteness is for people to realize they've been weaponized and taylor said um how can we recognize where our consciousness is colonized and act accordingly earlier someone mentioned shame i wonder if our willingness to pivot when we realize we've been colonized has to do with shame or denial yeah and, and um, Weaver's adding on that shame prevents um, community support, biggest hindrance to growth and learning. Thank you both. Amy. Yes. Okay. Sorry, I couldn't find the hands up thing. Um, I just wanted to piggyback off of, you know, bringing up the, um, the point of there being lack of Medicaid access in certain states. And, um, 
it's deliberate. It's a leftover from slave the abolition of slavery. And, and a, a lot of this is wrapped up in this. The the lie and the propaganda machine that had to be to make the world look the other some of the world look the other way during race based transatlantic slavery. And a big lie is that people from Africa are not internally motivated to work and take care of themselves. It was a huge lie in slavery. And it has carried over in our country's history into why we don't have universal health care and why it's so hard to get access to things is because there's still that that myth, that lie hanging in the ethers that we have to address. And, and um, yeah, but <laughs> it's all, there's so much. If you start learning about the propaganda that needed to happen for slavery, tra the transatlantic slavery trade to happen. There's so much is intertwined into that. And they had to say that the bullseye was is a white, aristocratic, educated, uh, heterosexual, neurotypical male. And, then, and the further we move away from that bullseye, the more we're labeled and given diagnoses and oppressed. <laughs> Did that make sense? I'll I'll stop now. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, I so, so so I mean, it's it, it's it's um you know when when you mention propaganda, like I where my brain went to is just even thinking about the ways in which history is packaged and taught to like young kids growing up. Like there's the things that get like not included in the story. Um, so that's that's what stood out to me. And so um, learning the history of, of 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 policies and programs like that, I think, is also important, I think, to Weaver's point about recognizing, um, you know, when when um, when. When. Bonds. It's not really what you said, but that's how my brain converted it. So um, I really am grateful to all of you for, for being here tonight and participating in your own way in this really important discussion. I think that having conversations like this um, and examining these issues and um, it is, is a really, it's, it, it, it's so mission critical to building an inclusive community. So thank you for being part of our community and we hope to see you next Tuesday. Um, I guess I'm supposed to, Lizzie made us a slide and I almost didn't use it. I'm so sorry. Hold on. Next month. So um, this is a preview of May Brain Club. A lot of really, um, also important conversations to be had um, around uh, the various ways in which ableism and internalized ableism shows up um, in, in, in daily life, in healthcare, in work. We're going to be uh, taking on, you know, Shane came up several times today, we're going to be uh, uh, doing a, a part two of, um, of Unlearning Shame. That'll be next, next month's book chat. So thank you all so much. Um, I look forward to seeing you next week. Bye.